that strong irritability that you see everywhere in the world right now, Dan Shen is the perfect antidote for that because it will calm the spirit and cool and soothe that irritability. Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. Well, I'm excited to have our first Chinese medicine practitioner on the show. I didn't know Toby prior to this, and I really enjoyed getting to know him. I think that like me, you'll find him to be very sweet, endearing, and super knowledgeable. He didn't even bat an eye when I interrupted him to talk about Tori Amos. So big score in my book. Toby received his undergraduate degree in food science from the California Polytechnic State University at San Luis Obispo. He began studying Chinese medicine in 1997 with Sunim Doam, a Korean monk trained in the Sa'am tradition. He earned his master's degree in traditional Chinese medicine in 2002 upon completion of training at the American College of Traditional Chinese Medicine in San Francisco and Chengdu University in China. During his four years of training in San Francisco, he interned with the prominent acupuncturist Dr. Angela Wu and learned to apply the lofty theories he was studying in school into the pragmatic setting of a busy clinic. In 2013, he developed the Chinese Nutritional Strategies app to provide digital access to the wealth of Chinese dietary wisdom. In 2016, proving that some people never learn, he completed a PhD in the classical Chinese medicine under the guidance of 88th generation Taoist priest Jeffrey Yuan. In 2021, he developed the Chinese Medical Characters app to enable direct access to foundational Chinese medical terms and concepts. Toby lectures internationally and in April 2023, he published his first book, An Introduction to Chinese Medicine, a patient's guide to acupuncture, herbal medicine, nutrition, and more. Well, welcome to the show, Toby. Thanks so much. Yeah, I'm so glad you reached out. Um, you know, sometimes I get people reaching out to be on the show, and it's just so obvious that they're just like selling nutraceuticals or something. And so it's easy to just kind of gloss over those things. But you reached out, and it was just such a, you know, a real connection and I loved what you're doing and I'm excited to have a Chinese medicine practitioner on the show. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for inviting me. And uh, I'm, I'm just so pleased to be on your uh, program and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, talking to another herb lover. So um, I'm excited too. Wonderful. Well, the place I always love to start out is uh, what pulled you into the plant path and brought you to us today? Yeah, thanks for asking me about that. Um, I started the acupuncture world um, through kind of the world of despair. It was sort of a tough time for me. Um, what I did is I graduated from, uh, I, I finished my undergraduate and I immediately got everything, Rosalie. Um, a cute girlfriend, awesome job. Um, I was making ice cream, uh, new ice cream flavors for a company in San Francisco. And if... Um, any of those flavors? Uh, do you do you guys have Trader Joe's by you, Rosalie? No, I live in the middle of nowhere, blissfully. So okay. we don't. Do you know have Trader any. Joe's? I do, though. Yes, okay. I've been to Trader Joe's. So th th we had a contract that any ice cream flavors I made that got accepted into Trader Joe's, also, I got a huge bonus for that. So eating, I my job is eat ice cream, eat things that might go into ice cream all day long. Um, a lot of money, cute girlfriend. Um, I, I was in San Francisco and uh, I had a great apartment with a good friend of mine. No commute. It was a six or seven block bike ride to and from work. So I had tons of free time, money. Um, you know, I was going to a lot of concerts and parties and things like this. Uh, everything a guy in his young 20s could possibly want. And uh, do you think I was happy, Rosalie? 
Yeah, I'm guessing there might have been something missing. Uh, yeah, but there wasn't any. I, I couldn't find anything missing, but I was. I just kept getting unhappier and unhappier. And it would talk to my friends about it, and, and they'd be like, "Oh, let's just go to this next concert. You know, you'll feel better." I was like, I felt worse after the last concert, and then just did more and more things. And uh, anyway, so everything was everything on the outside. I learned this. Understood. I understood this later, but everything on the outside was everything I could possibly have. If yeah. you know, say you, that, I have to ask Toby, were you going mm-hmm. to Tori Amos concerts? <laughs> that because might, if not, that might have been the problem. I, did, I don't know if she came through town then. I, I, I'd never seen a Tori Amos uh, concert, but okay, if she well. had come through, I, I definitely would have seen her. <laughs> All right, continue on. I just you know felt like yeah, it was my uh, obligation to mention that because you know yeah. I'd be disappointed in myself if I didn't. That, that could have dispelled the that could have dispelled the whole thing and then uh, <laughs> never gone on this journey. So. <laughs> Anyway, it's a good thing I didn't go to that concert. Maybe it ended up. Yeah, there you go. Good. There you go. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, it, it's it's sort of easy to make it light now, but I, I was really unhappy and I just couldn't figure out why. Um, it was so confusing for me. I started feeling so lost. And uh, I traveled before in Europe and I met some people that were going to Asia and it just sounded kind of cool. I put that in the back of my mind. And then as I got more and more lost, the only thing I could think to do was just get lost on the outside get myself lost on the outside too i mean it was it was really a desperation move so like i mentioned you know everything was going so well with me financially i didn't i had basically no obligations no family or anything and so um yeah i I thought oh well i'll I'll just go to asia three for six months or something like that and just see I, i really just wasn't sure what to do with myself so um that trip ended up being two years of just wandering around um but about So I got really sick on that trip. It ended up being nine countries in Southeast Asia, and I got really, really sick. Um, uh, You you can see me on video, um, 6'4", 200 pounds. I was down to like 150, Uh, just real skeletal, really bad diarrhea and no appetite. You have to picture this a little bit too, uh, a long red beard and long red hair and, and just kind of wandering around Asia. And, and I would see things, you know, like, oh, there's Everest Base Camp. Mm, you know, there's the Taj Mahal. There's the famous three colored lakes of Indonesia. You know, I, I just, it was a little bit similar for me being home in San Francisco too. I was seeing all these amazing things, but it just, nothing was, was really penetrating. And, um, and so uh, I was in Northern India at the time and um, I was on my way to Kashmir and it's a two day bus ride. And on this two day bus ride, uh, the person who ended up sitting next to me was a Korean Buddhist monk. And um, that's, that's, you know, I, I have no experience with monks or anything like that, but I just felt such a deep kinship with him, uh, an amazing kinship with him uh, just sitting here. So this two days of a uh, bus ride and then we arrived in Kashmir. Uh, Kashmir is a really dangerous place. So, at this at this time, it's beautiful but really dangerous. Uh, someone thrown a hand grenade into the farmers market uh, the day we arrived. So, you know, really. Anyways, it was it was the area was basically all cleared out of tourists except for this, this monk and I. And so we got a, a houseboat on uh, a doll lake, and um, and we just started chatting and talking. And he kept saying to me, "Wow, you're you're not do-, you know." I kept running to go to the bathroom all the time, and he kept saying, "Wow, you're not doing very well." Uh, I've got acupuncture needles. Um, you know, I, I'd love to help you out and, and, and see if you can feel better. Now, my background's all science. My grandfather's a medical doctor. And so I was pretty sure, like, needles without any medicine going in them, that's, that's really not going to do anything for me. So I just kept pushing them off, pushing them off for several weeks. After a few weeks of traveling together, I finally, I thought, he's such a nice man. It's not going to do anything for me, these needles, right? But he'll probably feel better if he if he puts these needles in. Maybe it might hurt me a little bit, but it's not, it's not going to help me. But he's so nice. Th- this will make him feel a lot better. And so I laid down. He put four needles in my body, just one side of my body. And I got up from that and had a full meal and three desserts. And and that's something I I hadn't been able to do for months. So I was just uh, amazed by that. So... Uh, you know, then my mind started switching, right? Wow, that, you know, needles couldn't do anything to, wow, that's amazing what the needles can do. So uh, my teacher just kept teaching me. And then he taught me uh, in, I visited him in Korea. And um, and then uh, he's visited me a couple times in the United States and just continued my education. Um, but, but then, so then a few months after meeting him, he and I parted ways. I went to Pakistan and he went to um, 
uh, he was going to Dharamsala. Anyways, we, 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 after six weeks of traveling together, we, we switched paths. And then months and months later, when I was traveling, I was thinking, that's, you know, I just was so impressed what he was able to do. And then suddenly it started clicking in my mind, oh, maybe I could learn how to do that. And so then I came home uh, immediately uh, uh, enrolled in Chinese medical school. And then Chinese medical school, that's when I really fell in love with the herbs. You know, I was already loving it with acupuncture and the, and the, and the, the basic theory of Chinese medicine. I'm still, to this day, I feel so lucky. I wake up every morning, so happy to be a cl clinician in Chinese medicine. It's so beautiful and so, you know, can help people so, uh, so fundamentally. So I'm so happy about that. But so uh, I had despair and then I had uh, introduction to acupuncture and then acupuncture unlocked herbal medicine for me. Uh, and so that, that's, the, that's, that's the long route to how I, I fell in love with herbal medicine. And I'm curious, Toby, what would you say was, I mean, I think we could infer a lot of things from your story, but what would you say was the missing piece? Like what, you know, the difference between despair and then what you found? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> that's a really key part of it. So my teacher, he basically helped, you know, basically saved my life because I was, I was just going down and and I, I didn't, I didn't care enough to help myself. So he basically saved my life, and then he gave me something to do with it. I, he put me on the path of medicine, and then also he taught me meditation. And meditation is looking inside, which I, I thought again, everything was on the outside perfect, but inside was just a mess. But I, I just didn't, you know, that in the, raised in this culture, in this Western culture, I just had no idea you could even look inside, and then actually organize things a little bit better on the inside. I, I just had no idea. Mm -hmm. What a blessing to find him yes. and then have the six weeks. I mean, people often talk about travel and how unexpected things can happen and you never even know. And this is a just a beautiful story of that finding awesome. your teacher, finding yourself. I'm pretty glad I didn't go to that Tori Amos concert now. Well, okay. <laughs> I guess that's all the time we have today, Toby. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me on the program, Leslie. <laughs> Um, I can I can concede, <laughs> but maybe we could compromise and say both could be possible. Okay, um, yes. Yeah, she is on tour right now, so you could still enjoy touring. Okay, then. I'll take, <laughs> I'll take that highly recommended. I'll, I'll go check it out. Thank you. Well, I'm really excited for the plant that you're going to share today because this is the first time we've had this plant on here, and it's a plant that I love deeply. So I'd love to hear why you chose Don Shen for today. Yeah. So my single herb teachers, they always said the same thing to me over and over again. Don't have your favorite herb, right? You have to treat everything equally and then you can't have your favorite herb. But Rosalie, I don't know about you, but for me, I mean, that, that's impossible, right? There, there's certain herbs that you just have so much resonance with. And for me, it's Don Chen, right? I have so much resonance with this. And, um, and so that it, it's, it's an amazing herb. It does a lot of things. I, it's beautiful. Um, it, it's powerful and, and uh, almost free of side effects. So, I, I mean, it, it's, it's just, uh, it's one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite herbs. Again, despite my teachers <laughs> highly recommending not to have your favorite herbs, Tan Chen just got early in as one of my favorite herbs and now um, uh, a little over 20 years as a clinician. And yeah, it's still one of my favorite herbs. Oh, hmm. uh, I'm, I'm drinking it right now. Oh, lovely. Could you share with us some of the, um, th the names of Don Chen? uh in what way oh uh, uh like just latin the, yeah latin and anything else you might want to share I, I was going to help have you help me with that uh you know for, for so in chinese medicine we always we always use the chinese name so we call dan chen and then and then everyone's what we call salvia root right but we don't really do that and rosalie i heard about do you know how to pronounce latin names with confidence Okay, that's that's even better than my answer, though. But somebody told me uh, you pronounce them how your teacher pronounced them. Oh, nice. so that was that was really good. But so, uh, yes, this uh, if you if you don't mind pronouncing it for me, it'd be better. Oh my gosh, I was kind of going to rely on you, Toby, because I do pronounce it with confidence, but I do not know that it's correct. But I call it salvia mellitzerize. Okay, that that's so much better than uh, I was actually trying to practice a little bit. That that's much better than any of my practicing. So, that's great. Yes. So, anyways, uh, I I can't say the Latin name, but I, I love it anyways. Um, Fair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So yeah, I mean the and this I think one of the reasons I love it too is is sort of the perfect herb for the uh, modern patient. 
Um, you know, uh, I, I think you're really familiar with for uh, Chinese medicine, uh, Dong Wei, Angelica Sinesis. Mm -hmm. uh, it is so it's been so popular over the millennia, uh, but that's that's a blood nourisher, and then it it does move a little bit of blood, um, especially different portions of that uh, that root, uh, like the head of the dongwe, it it really nourishes well, and then the tail, the 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 lowest part of the herb, that uh, helps move everything. So uh, move blood. So especially sometimes we'll break it up. We'll use just the head if we just want to nourish, or we just use the tail if we just want to move it. Uh, move blood in the body. Um, but, but, you know, from my experience, my clinical experience, like most people overnourished, right? So they, they don't need that much nourishment. Um, I think back in the old days, especially in China, right? There's so much famine, so many problems and things like that. Everyone was always a little undernourished. Uh, in our modern culture, I think everyone's uh, overnourished for the most part and then under circulated, right? People just don't move properly. And so the nice thing about Dan Chen, it has that same quality but uh, as uh, Dong Wei, but in reverse, right? So it's a much better blood mover and then does nourish the blood a little bit. And then a special good quality for it, it's uh, slightly cold, the Dan Chen, and then, um, and, and then it has a special quality for uh, uh, Chinese medicine, we say calms the spirit. So that, that, uh, that strong irritability uh, that you see everywhere in the world right now, Dan Shen is the perfect antidote for that because it will calm the spirit and cool and soothe that irritability. Mm. Um, we're going to talk about your recipe that you've shared with us in just a mm. bit. But before we do that, I wonder if you could expand a little bit more on moving the blood and uh, why someone would want to do that. Yeah, um, th that's, that's, that's such a good uh, question about that, right? So for Chinese medicine, we have we have an idea that if everything's moving in the body, it's impossible to have any kind of pain. So if there's any pain in the body, you know, we use the Chinese term qi. This just means like a, a functional aspect of the body or blood, more of the structural part of the body. If either one of those is not moving properly, we have pain. If both of those are moving, it's impossible to experience pain in our body. So this is this is so valuable. Uh, people, you know, have like uh, chronic pain and irritability and things like that. Danchen is so helpful for that because it, it can help with the pain, calm the spirit, and everything like that. So, yeah, for Chinese medicine, I mean, the, 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 at the crux of the system is uh, supplementing enough things in the body, and then the second part is making sure everything moves properly in the body. So this is a really important uh, aspect for movement. Uh, could be fluids, could be qi, uh, could be blood. Um, it's important to keep all these things moving. Wonderful. I'd love to talk about the plant itself because it's a very striking plant. It's beautiful sage flowers. Uh, but what we typically use are the roots in medicine. And how would you describe how those roots look? Um, I get some locally grown Danjan, and it, th this is always really exciting for us when we get that package in, uh, harvested in the fall. So I brought some today, but it's 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 really lost a lot of its brilliance by now. Mm. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's a deep crimson. It, it's just, it's beautiful deep crimson. It's dark, but it has like a glow to it too. It's just so gorgeous. Everyone comes and gathers around that. My office manager and I were just so excited when we get the Danjan in. And then any patients that are coming by are really drawn to it and come over and look at it and hold it and things like this. It's really beautiful color. The the name of uh, the Chinese name for it, Dan Chen, uh, Dan means cinnabar. So th this this really red, this deep red color. And then Shan is a little bit unusual too. Usually in for uh, Chinese language, for roots, we call them bun or gun. Th these two things uh, are usually for roots. Every once in a while, really special roots that have a you know really uh, elevated quality. We, we, we it's also a root, but it's a special root we, we call shen. The other the other one that comes to mind is renshen. This is a ginseng, right? So any of these kind of special roots, uh, they get this designation of shen. So so dan shen is a cinnabar special root. Mm, lovely. Um, I'm wondering if you'll speak to Don Shen and it's um, kind of, what do I want to say? It's special affinity for the heart and cardiovascular system. Yes, yeah, so I uh, think thanks so much for uh, for saying that too. Yeah, I mean, uh, every herb has a certain uh, affinity and a resonance with an organ system. And this one has a resonance with uh, um, pericardium and the heart. Uh, and so it's going to really influence that. So this is for modern use, especially in China, you know, uh, 
thousands of studies about this now, about the, ben the cardiac benefits of Dan Shen. And then also for, it's interesting for Chinese medicine, when we say Xin, we, we say the heart, that includes the mind. And so mm. interestingly enough, uh, Dan Shen has really good affinity for strokes too. Uh, it, it, special caveat for that, right? It can't, it has to be some type of occlusion where you need to move that. If there's any kind of break in the vessel, obviously that's not good because you don't want to move blood out of the vessel. It's a, a good distinction there. Yeah. And I love that, that connection with the head as well in terms of calming the spirit, uh, as you were talking about before too. Yeah, for, for Chinese medicine, everything uh, begins in the in the organ systems, and then it kind of floats up to the brain. We have a really derogatory uh, term we use for the brain uh, from the Taoists. They call it the mud ball palace, <laughs> because everyone wants to give it all the uh, all the credit, but actually everything comes from the organs. Mm. And that recipe you shared with us is a calm spirit tincture, um, which combines two herbs which I'd love for you to talk more about that as well. Uh, sure. So Don Chen's the, the lead herb. It's a four to one ratio. And then uh, He Huan Hua uh, is the other one. Uh, do you want to help me with the Latin on that one? Uh, so that's Albizia, and many people know it as mimosa flowers. Yeah, or silk tree flower. Silk tree flower, yes. Um, yeah, so the, for Chinese medicine, uh, Emotion-wise, uh, the, the heart is, is one of our predominant uh, aspects for the organ system. Uh, this, this is the, the heart is the one that rules the other 11 organs. So it's, it's so important. And emotion-wise, having to do with love and, and just in charge of everything else. Um, but the really important other aspect for us emotion-wise for Chinese medicine is the liver. Um, the liver, if we, if we can keep everything smoothly moving through it, then everything is really easy. And even we have strong emotions, but they smoothly say like silk, you know, emotions can move through our bodies like silk. Then we don't, you know, everything, even if you have strong emotions, it doesn't, it doesn't harass you or anything like that. It just silk, silkily moves through your body. So the ha huan hua helps with that. So this is such a, uh, a nice combination, right? To uh, the affinity with the heart and the liver, these two major emotional systems in the body, keep them cool and moving. Uh, it, it's, it's really helpful. Mm -hmm. Lovely. And for folks who want to download their recipe card for the Calm Spirit Tincture, it's a beautifully illustrated card by Tatiana, and you can get that at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com. Thanks, Tatiana. Yeah, thanks, Tatiana. <laughs> what else would you like to share about Don Shen? Yeah, it, it's such a great herb. It's really stable. Rosalie, you probably know about the Shenang Ban Sao Jing. It's the Early, first materia medica that we still have uh, from China. Do you, do you know about that one? Is that yellow emperors? Uh, no, the, the yellow emperors is all the theoretical aspects. And the, yeah, there okay. are some herbs in there. This is the um, uh, the translation a lot of times is uh, like divine husbandman's mm -hmm. uh, materia medica. Yeah, anyway, it's been over a decade since I've been in okay. TCM school, so that was a little bit rusty for me. Okay, <laughs> that, that, that is fair. But anyways, so th this Materia Medica that we still have it is so beautiful. Um, early on, it was organized into three categories. So uh, the Chinese medicine, uh, they, they just love um, natural things. So they, they get the 365 herbs to represent 365 days of the year. And then they put them into three categories, uh, up, upper like uh, fantastic herbs, middle, and then low quality, lower herbs. And so we're really fortunate. Don Chen itself is in the upper uh, category. Uh, this is, this is uh, anyways, it's interesting to see the orientation for Chinese medicine so early on. Uh, the upper class herbs uh, don't do anything. They don't treat any disease. It's purely for to enhance your longevity. So that's a little bit interesting. And then middle class herbs, they help with any kind of constitutional deficiencies that we have. Ho Huan Hua is in that middle category. And then the lower quality, this is so interesting for Chinese medicine. So 125, 120, 100, and then 120 at the lower. These lower 120, these, they feel like these really low quality ones. These are the ones actually treat disease. So if you have any kind of disease, you have to use these because these herbs are they're, they're, they're not going to help what we really want longevity. But it, sure, if you have some disease or something, you can use those. So Don Chen being the, the highest category one, this one is fine to take for long term uh, Don Chen. So that, that, that's good to say that one right away, right? It, it, it's designed to be able to take it long term for preventative, for longevity enhancing. Um, 
And then, oh yeah. And the other thing I really wanted to say is yes. So it, it does have some qualities for that longevity and it invigorates blood. So we really cannot, uh, if there's already a bleeding problem, without adding other herbs to it, we really can't use uh, Don Chen if there's any type of bleeding problem. Like I was saying before, if there's a stroke uh, that, that's due to uh, uh, breakage in the blood vessels, Don Chen's completely contraindicated. Conversely, if it's from an occlusion, then Don Chen is really um, uh, called for. And like I said, study after study in uh, China has confirmed that using it for uh, stroke due to occlusion. And then all the same thing with heart attack, atrial fibrillate, all, all these kind of things, uh, uh, brain and uh, heart studies over and over again. They even take the crude herb and inject it directly uh, via IV, and that's working amazing. Yeah, it's amazing what they're doing with herbs in that regard. And even in the United States, they recognize this. This is especially interesting about Don Chen. So Don Chen plus two other herbs, um, San Qi, uh, we call Nodo Ginseng, and uh, Bing Pian, uh, which is like a Borneal. So this combination, Don Chen being the, uh, the lead herb, uh, and it just passed its stage three clinical trials, the crude herb formulation. This has never happened in the history of the oh, United wow. States. They wow. approved it. The, uh, and so now it's going to uh, stage four clinical trials, the crude herbs. They tried for so long to take just the active ingredients of all these three, okay. and they mm -hmm. just they just, it, it's too, and especially then once it's combined, right? It's too mm -hmm. much to take up. So they just left that aside. And the safety profile is amazing on this, right? Because like I said, Don Chen is such a good herb as a lead herb and then, you know, powerfully helpful. And yeah, so the, the, the clinical trials were in the U.S. even were doing for the, um, for stroke from occlusion and uh, any type of chest pain, palpitations, mm -hmm. chest pain, everything. So. Hmm. Oh, thanks for sharing that. Um, I always love it when kind of the science of it is can um, be done in such a way as confirming traditional use. And like you said, so seldomly are they using whole plants well, and instead are using isolated extracts. So that's really wonderful to see that. Uh, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. And if you can't answer this, this is fine. Okay. But I'm curious you know, just hearing all this talk about Don Chen and the heart, and it makes me think of hawthorn berries, mm. which I know hawthorn berries are used a little bit differently in the different systems. But, you know, in Western herbalism, that's kind of like our premier heart herb that is very nourishing. We can take it for a long time. So I'm curious if you have knowledge about hawthorn berries, and if so, um, the kind of a comparison between Don Chen and hawthorn berries and how they might be similar and different. Okay, yeah. I'm glad you uh, you asked me a question I knew the answer to, so that's good. Okay. Yeah, I use I use shanja all the uh, uh, hawthorn berry in Chinese medicine we call shanja. Uh, I use that every day in the clinic. Uh, it's it's a great herb, but yeah, we use it a little bit differently. But I I think that this you know historically for Chinese medicine this might help inform uh, your fellow herbalists too about how to use it. In in China we use it especially if people eat tons and tons of meat to help them kind of break down all the byproducts for that. So that sort of makes sense with us, especially Americans, right? Eat way too much meat. And then Sean John might be able to really help them and then help heart health with that. So I think it's a, uh, like uh, vegetarians and things like that. I think Sean John is going to be a little bit less helpful for, uh, but heavy meat eaters uh, that, are, that happen to your, your patients, I think Sean John is especially indicated, you know, uh, according to Chinese medicine. In Chinese medicine, is um, the hawthorn berries considered as much as a blood mover? Because I don't know that we talk about that really in Western herbalism. It's more yeah. considered like nourishing. Um... Yeah, for, for, for Chinese herbal medicine, again, I just have a sense about it because I'm just an herbalist now, not like, a, you know, uh, I'm not a student anymore. That, that's just how you, but we use it for, uh, for breaking down like uh, phlegm dampness and, and we, we have a uh, food stagnation is a term we use in Chinese medicine where everything's just mm -hmm. stuck from eating so much rich stuff. It's great for breaking all that through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thanks for that. My own satisfying my own curiosity there. Good. Yeah. And so, so again, oh, sorry, that would be a great combination, right? Is Dan Chen and Shan Jia. Um, mm. You know, say you have uh, someone with chest pain and, um, and the history of eating a lot of meats and things like that, that would be fantastic. And uh, has to be some kind of heat signs too. Uh, Don Chen is slightly cold too. So it's so fantastic for most Americans that are all overheated, but you have to be a little bit careful if they're cool too. 
Well, so we, we heard your story about how you got started in all of this. And, and then from that, you went, um, as I read in your bio, you did lots more studies. And now you're, um, my understanding is mainly a practitioner. You work with people one-on-one. -on -one. And you've also recently published a book, which is very exciting, An Introduction to Chinese Medicine, A Patient's Guide to Acupuncture, Herbal Medicine, Nutrition, and More. I'd love to hear more about the book, why you decided to write a book, because that's no small endeavor, and um, who the book is really for. Okay. Yeah, thanks so much for asking me about that. Uh, Rosalie, do you remember uh, when you wrote your first book? And you did several years working on it. It was just an idea. And then finally you got it in your hands. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. So this is last Saturday for me. Oh, uh, right. it, it's, it's so uh, the, the thrill hasn't worn off at all because it's so exciting to get just an idea in your hands. Uh, and it was so exciting. Yeah, well, congratulations. Thanks, thanks so much. Yeah, again, other authors, they know how much work goes into that. Um, so yeah, I, re I really enjoy your book too. So beautiful too. Herbal Alchemy, right? It was mm -hmm. so fantastic. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. And I especially appreciate that. Sometimes when I read Western herb uh, books, I get a little uh, disappointed because it'll be, uh, these herbs are for headache. Mm, these yeah. herbs yeah. are for if the stomach pain. <laughs> and, and for Chinese medicine, we never talk like that. So I was so pleased with your, um, your energetics of the herbs especially mm -hmm. the wet, dry, hot, cold dynamic. This is exactly how we do with Chinese medicine with the uh, yin yang. So I was really pleased about your book. So uh, yeah. yeah. I began I studying herbal medicine through Chinese medicine. So that is not something I really draw upon today as much, but it definitely informs who I am as an herbalist every single day. It really showed in your book. I was so happy about that. So uh, um, before, maybe just give you a quick aside about my uh, teacher Dr. Wu. When I was just a student, I was so enthusiastic about herbs. And uh, in the morning, uh, I would go to Chinese medical school. And then for four years, I'd intern at her uh, clinic, really busy clinic, 60 patients a day. Originally, she was seeing a lot of HIV, AIDS before the antiretrovirals. And then later on, like a lot of fertility and things. But anyways, really busy practitioner. So she, I would just come in there, intern, do anything, walk her dog, uh, painted her clinic, I, I'd do anything just to, to to see how she operated in clinic. So every once in a while she lets us ask questions. In the morning, I learned uh, Wade's uh, uh, Cassandra berry, and I was really impressed with it. Uh, it it's the five flavor uh, herb, and I was I thought it was so cool, right? So I kind of bucked up the courage to say to Dr. Wu, Dr. Wu, is Wu Wade's uh, a good herb? She was furious. She got in my face. I said, this is 25 years ago, <laughs> so remember this? She got in my face and said, for who, when, and then turned on her heel and walked away. And so this is kind of, a, it just rocked my whole paradigm of Chinese medicine. Of course, we can never say something good or bad. We always have to say for who, what's, what's their constitution, what's going on with them right now, when, what's the seasonal or climatic factors that's going on. Of course, we, we, we can never answer, is this a good or bad herb? So mm. uh, that, anyway, so I was so happy that for, for your uh, your herbal book too, then you were always saying, or for who, when, right? We always have to consider that kind of thing. It is, there's no good or bad herbs, only appropriate or inappropriate herbs for that mm. person yeah. at that time. Yeah, yeah, that's a powerful um, story to go through. You know, it's kind of like kind of very intense like that, but I, yeah, it is kind of my pet peeve of like everybody, like how much turmeric is like, you know. Yes. You know, it's like as if turmeric is good for everybody all the time. Yes, it's an amazing art, but it is not good for everybody all the time. That's that's something else I'd love for your uh, from your book too. Uh, you call it the one solution syndrome. Is that right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is so fantastic. I mean, I, I have a similar idea to that, but not not succinctly like how you placed it. I, I was so pleased mm -hmm. to have that one. So if you don't mind, can I borrow that? Uh, that Absolutely. concept? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Well, Toby, I love, I asked you about your book and all you've done is say sweet things about my book, which okay. I appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed your book. Um, yeah, thank you. Hmm. One, you know, you're a busy practitioner. You know, what got it in your head to write the book? And I'm also curious who the book is for. And the reason why I'm asking that is because someone might think like, oh, I don't know anything about Chinese medicine or um, I don't know. Just, you know, like, who did you write this book for? Who do you think <laughs> is going to like pick up this book and say like, yeah, I love this book. <laughs> okay. You're so sweet, Rosalie. Thanks for getting me back on track. Yes. So. <laughs> What happened is uh, 
gosh, almost two years ago, um, I was volunteering at a meditation retreat and it's 10 day silent meditation retreat. And so a whole bunch of volunteers come in and help while everyone's in, in silence. We're preparing food and doing a whole bunch of things. So it's a whole bunch of people that don't know each other. They come together and they work like 12 hour days, 14 hour days, just doing everything. So the first day we get there, everyone is, you know, introducing themselves what they do. And I've been on retreats before where some, it, it always seems to be like a theme of volunteers. So one other time it was home of MDs, MD, PhD, Ayurvedic practitioner, uh, naturopath, and me, right? So it was so great. We had so much good conversation. This one happened to be all biotech people. So it was all really high-level biotech people. They were working on like computer simulating proteins and what would happen. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff I don't really understand. But so it was all biotech people all introducing each other and going around. And then uh, it comes to me and then, oh, what do you do? Oh, I practice Chinese medicine. And Rosalie, immediately all the arms kind of go up in front of their uh, uh, chest and they give me a little bit of side uh, shoulder. Hmm. You know, hmm. So Chinese medicine, right? And so. Kind of like you when you were in your 20s. Exa this is exactly, this <laughs> exactly how I started, right? It just just thinking, what, you know, what Chinese medicine? So, you know, what is that? You know, I, I just immediately dismiss it, not knowing anything about it. It's, it's the height of ignorance, right? You don't know anything about it, but immediately dismiss it. Dismiss it. That I was guilty of that myself. And not just dismissing it, I was a little bit hostile toward it, you know, like, you know, I, I, anyways, but just so much ignorance. So anyways, over the course of these 10 days, we, we had a lot of conversations when we were preparing meals and doing a whole bunch of things. And at the end of the 10 days, everyone was like, hey, if I ever have any problem, I'm going to go get Chinese medicine. And so I've had those exact conversations one th thousands of times. And then something about that conversation with those people just clicked in my mind. I thought, I better write this down. Basically, everything I talked about for those 10 days, I better just write that down. And, uh, and then for the first few months of, of, of writing the book, I thought, I'll just write a little bit. And I don't think this is going to be a book. I'll just write a little bit. And then I kept writing and kept writing. And then I showed some people that early on, they were really encouraging. And so eventually, uh, you know, it just, it kind of came together. So, excuse me, it's for anybody in biotech that uh, wants to understand Chinese medicine, uh, you know, to, to not, not uh, like, oh, Chinese medicine is so great, but this, this is what Chinese medicine is. These are its modalities. This is its historical references. Uh, th this is, this is how it works. And here's the modern research. Again, uh, for me, I make almost no clinical decisions based on modern research because that's an of a thousand people at the most. We're, for Chinese historical uh, record, we have an end of hundreds of millions, right? It's, for me, I always, I always weight that so much heavier, the historical uh, references. So, but yeah, lo lo a lot of people love to talk about that. Oh, this is the latest research does this, or like Don Chen. I, Don Chen, I'm so impressed with, and, and even the US FDA is so impressed with Don Chen. So that's, that's cool to talk about and that kind of thing. So if, if you're in biotech, and you're curious about Chinese medicine, this is the book for you. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that um, the premise of that. It makes me think of kind of my own healing story in that I was diagnosed with a very rare autoimmune disease. And mm. um, I was at a Swedish hospital in Seattle, had a whole team of specialists. And they were just like, the, you know, this is incurable. You will die in 20 years with a steadily declining quality of life before then. Um, there's nothing we can do for you except give you very high doses of steroids, which has side effects and will decrease over time. Here's a brochure. They gave me a brochure um, and sent me on my way, which kind of similar to yours. You know, then I, the next thing I did was I was in Seattle. So um, I didn't have a lot of money. I just started going to all the Bastyr student clinics mm. and went to um a five element acupuncturist and went to a Chinese herbalist and started, you know, drinking all those um, not super yummy uh, decoctions and I got better and it just blew my mind. I mean, I, it really wasn't that I like turned there first because I really was in the Western medicine mindset, but Western medicine was so definitive that they couldn't do anything to help me. Um, that it made it easy to say like, okay, well, what else? Like, I just was not going to like step aside and accept that as my fate. And I think that could be true for a lot of people, whether it's, you know, any type of herbalism, Chinese medicine, there's so much wisdom there that is so relevant in today's world. And um, I think it is easy to dismiss when we don't understand it. And your book seems to be really helping people to understand this different, it's, I mean, it's in a completely different paradigm, right? It's not just taking herbs instead of drugs. It's 
thinking about health and dis-ease and constitution in just this totally different ways than most of us, um, I imagine, who's listening to the show have, you know, been raised to think about these things. Yeah, I think from the Western side, right, they, they look at the head and they, they see a computer and the heart a pump. And, you know, and so it's just really mechanistic. But for, I always tell my patients I'm a gardener, right? A little bit mm -hmm. like you were talking about in your book, right? You're trying to get some irrigation here or too much irrigation, trying to drain that off or too hot or too cold, too ascending, too descending. You know, basically, we're just I'm, I'm just tending everyone's uh, garden so it, it functions well. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a, yeah, like you use the word paradigm. Yeah, it's a totally different paradigm from their very beginning. Uh, yin yang uh, garden metaphor or cell disease theory. It, it starts off uh, foundationally totally different. And so then they end up really different places. Mm, yeah. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for all that you've shared, Toby. And before we go, I'd love to ask you one more question. Um, oh, actually, before that, I'm just going to back up here. Okay. <laughs> I want to talk about your funny YouTube video. So um, <laughs> just to give everyone some context here, Toby reaches out and says, you know, hi, introduces himself, asks about the podcast, shares that he's writing this book. And then he shares his YouTube channel, which has a handful of videos on there. And um, so, you know, I go to check it out and you just have the funniest video of what it's like to be an acupuncturist at the grocery store. <laughs> and I highly recommend, we'll put a link to it in the show notes for people to go check that out. Um, but maybe you could just recreate a little bit of that just so people can see what I'm laughing about. So it's not just me. Yes. I'm just at this small, I'm in a small town. So every time I go to the grocery store, I, I see at least four people that are patients or know about me or something like that. So they're just always, uh, coming up to me and, and asking about <clears throat> how's their aunt's leucorrhea doing, or, you know, <laughs> they're just always coming up to me to talk about things or, or let me know about how well they're doing or some concerns they have about acupuncture that are unfounded that I have to disbunk, debunk in aisle seven. Um, <laughs> So yeah, you you were telling me just before we start rolling, do you, you have a lot of the same experiences? Uh, yes, I'm not a practitioner anymore, so I uh -huh. don't have those personal questions. But the my most member, but that did happen often because I also live in a small town. And my most memorable is um, I was with my husband, and we were on some anniversary date at you know a nice restaurant, and I knew the server as you know a client of mine, and she I don't know people are just like. It blows my mind that she did this to this day, but she updated me on her vaginal infection with my husband sitting there at this restaurant. And, you know, no, like, no shame about that at all. It was just kind of like, okay, this is what's happening right now. Like, I'm just going to roll with this, you know? So, um, yeah, that that was my most notable. But that has happened so many times. And, um, yeah, so I would often tell people, in my practice, like you don't have to know me on the street. Like if I'm, mm. I'm often with my husband or, you know, you don't have to, we don't have to pretend like we know each other outside of the office. Like you're 100%, everything's private. I don't share it with anybody, et cetera. But it's, you know, people often don't mind discussing it on the street or at the restaurant or in the grocery aisle. So I also have that experience. Yes. For sure. I'm thinking too, that that patient probably had such a deep connection with you, you know, and then you helped her so much. So then you know, she, she yeah. didn't think socially at all. She just thought, oh, yeah. God, Rosalie, I've got to let her know, you know, yeah. uh, but that, that, that's yeah. maybe a compliment to you as a clinician, you know, to, yeah. to be able to have that deep rapport with that patient. Yeah. And I actually didn't mind. It was more just like, you know, funny to me. I'm like, oh, okay. That, that's what we're doing right now. Happy anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So romantic. Yeah. yeah. Um, so definitely it's a great, I love that, um, I'm guessing you like filmed that at your local grocery store too. Cause that's yes. like, yeah, that's great. <laughs> I, I know the owners. So they, I got the, okay. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So definitely check that out. And, um, and now um, that we've covered that very important topic, I would love to ask you the question I'm asking everybody in season eight, which is what has been your most important herbal mistake? Yeah, the, the, this, the, the answer to this came up to me immediately. <clears throat> When, when you asked me this question, um, it, it, was, it was such a bad mistake that I wrote a whole journal of Chinese medicine article about it. Uh, it was pretty bad. And just in case uh, your, um, your listeners might be interested in it, uh, I'll see if the Journal of Chinese Medicine will okay a PDF for your, um, for your uh, show notes page because it, okay. it's a really embarrassing uh, story for me. And so, but everyone, I've got a lot of feedback. Everyone really appreciated it because uh, it was a pretty bad mistake. 
So anyways, yeah. uh, you remember from your uh, Chinese medicine study days that uh, we always diagnose with patterns. So uh, I have this patient that had been presented with a certain pattern and it was like textbook. So uh, for this pattern, she had, a, we'd expect fatigue. She had it. She had a swollen uh, pale tongue with tooth marks. She had it, uh, digestive discomfort, a lot of bloating, gas, diarrhea, maybe a couple of other things. Exactly this pattern. I want to guess, spleen chi deficiency. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and so remember. Yeah, so it's great. I mean, it just exactly textbook. This almost never happens, right? And I think this is what part of the trap for me. So uh, the spleen sheet deficiency pattern, right? Exactly textbook and uh, treated all those things. Oh, even brain fog, right? A stuffy head feeling, you know, exactly the spleen sheet deficiency. So uh, resolved a lot of those things uh, pretty beautifully. She was so happy and, you know, just a huge fan of Chinese medicine. Sent a whole bunch of family members. They got benefits, everything great. So then... She, uh, her menstrual cycle a little bit late uh, or a little bit long, uh, uh, still bleeding after nine days. And so she comes to me and says, uh, oh yeah, you know, I wonder if you can help me with this. You know, I have so much uh, confidence in that. Oh, here's the latest uh, example of spleen chi deficiency for her. Uh, part of that uh, pattern is spleen chi deficiency. One of the things it doesn't do, if the spleen chi is too deficient, it can't hold the blood in the vessels. So I think, oh, this is so straightforward. So this is going to be really easy. So I uh, treat her and uh, the bleeding continues. And so, yeah, the, to make it uh, a long clinical story short, and then anyone can read about this if they want to, uh, for the next six weeks, that same pattern keeps happening. I treat her and the bleeding doesn't stop. I, in fact, I give her a formula that the bleeding increases for two days. So I had to take her off that. And then put her on another one. So I, you know, she's getting paler and paler and weaker and weaker. And but she has so much confidence in Chinese medicine. I had to say, well, you know, maybe see what the Western medicine can do, right? So uh, she reluctant. I'm surprised as a Chinese medicine clinician how often I have to talk people into going to Western medicine. But that's part of my job too, right? Uh, let's see what's happening. So she takes or she goes to see the doctor. Doctor immediately diagnoses. Okay, this is so great. We'll give you some oral progestin. No problem. Bleeding stops. But as you, you know, with the Western medicine, sometimes horrific side effects. She's get splitting headaches all day long. Uh, she's nauseous and vomiting. So she's a CPA of a really you know, big corporation with a couple hundred employees. So she can't be vomiting and have a headache and be a CPA. So she says to the doctor, he says, well, you know, if you want to stop the bleeding, uh, we have to be on that. She, so she stops taking the progestin. Immediately the uh, bleeding comes back. So... What does she do, Rosalie? I don't know. I'm on the edge of my seat, though. She comes to me again, Rosalie. Right. Yeah. She says, comes to you. It says, why did you fix this? So remember, now I've given her six different formulas, all of them uh, completely ineffective. Actually, one formula I gave her, bleeding increased for two days. So it's not like I've had no effect on her. I made her worse for two days also. <laughs> So, but she's still so competent. Again, those, those other things, right? We resolve so quickly and easily. She's so excited, digestive system, brain functioning good, no more loose stools, every, you know, you know, almost lifelong diarrhea, you know, or at lo least loose stools, all resolved, normal bowel movement, everything's so great. So she comes back to me again to fix this. So Rosalie, what do I do? Start from scratch. I took her to my teacher. <laughs> Hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> even even better than even better than starting from scratch. I realize yeah. I've got nothing. Uh, I've I've got the arsenal of Chinese medicine, right? But I don't know how to use it. A little mm -hmm. bit early practitioner. Like, again, uh, Chinese. We have a database, eighty five thousand formulas, right? So I tried six or seven, maybe eight at that point, and so eight for zero, I'd gone. But I don't want to try all eighty five thousand. So I take her. So I, <laughs> thank you. So I take her, I take her to my teacher, uh, Li Feng Liang. She's retired now in San Francisco, but she was my um, Chinese medicine gynecology teacher and just a really accomplished clinician, 40, 50 years experience, you know, just really good clinician. So she, you know, I, I take my patient, uh, she greets us really warmly, takes us in and uh, does an examination, everything like that. And then uh, Li Feng Liang, uh, Dr. Liang, she, she turns to me and says, did you read my book? And she, she's got a great uh, TCM gynecology book. And I said, yes, uh, Dr. Leong, I, I read your book and uh, actually used a formula from your book uh, in desperation and, uh, and it made the bleeding worse for two days. So I stopped it after that. 
uh, she looked at me like only someone who's been in clinic for 40 or 50 years could, wrote out a prescription for that formula, uh, gave it to my patient. She went, we went and filled in her pharmacy. And so she started taking that. Two days, heavy bleeding. Third day, slowed down. Fourth day, stopped. That is after we're looking at two months maybe even three months of bleeding, you know, two between two, it, it's all detailed in that uh, article, but maybe two or three months of bleeding and uh, resolved. And so uh, uh, she did a pack of that for maybe two or three weeks. And then, uh, and then one other uh, one month cycle, uh, Dr. Leong also recommended as a, like a regulate the cycle formula and uh, resolved never to come again. So, that was my major uh, mistake that immediately popped in my head when you when you sent me the questions you were going to ask me is major mistake you made. Yes, just clinging to a pattern, even though clearly over and over again, it was unambiguous, the effect uh, that I was getting in the clinic, that I was on the wrong track. But still, I, I just, I couldn't, I, I couldn't pull out of that pattern. It seemed, it was so textbook. Um, I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't break that spell. And so you're, teacher did prescribe the same formula, but it wasn't that your patient was on it long enough. Is that what happened? Yeah. So, so uh, mm -hmm. it was, it, so usually this is contraindicated, especially for spleen, if it's coming from spleen sheet deficiency by a teacher, Dr. Leong, she felt like this was an excess condition. And so if excess conditions, we want to move. So she gave her blood movers. I think uh, Don Chen might've been in there. Again, it's in that article. Don Chen might've been in there, but uh, maybe not. I can't remember for sure, but it's definitely in that class, the same class as Don Chen. So usually that's 100% contraindicated. Like I was saying before, bleeding problem, then you can't, you, you can't do that. But for her case, she really did have a whole bunch of stasis, blood stasis. And so we had to move that blood stasis for her to be able to close everything and then stop mm. bleeding. So, mm. so yeah, I tried that exact formula. And, and, and I thought I was on the wrong track because that bleeding increased for two days with, with Dr. Leong's experience. She know, again, she's seen, you know, tens of thousands of patients. And so she knew that sometimes it's bleeding for a couple of days, but then it's resolved. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The amount of experience and confidence you would need to see that through. Um, yes. I, I had 0% of that and Dr. Leong had 100%. So she, yeah. she was fine. I'll never forget that look in her eye when she wrote that exact formula again. I was like, wow, Dr. Leong. All right. Mm. I love another like takeaway from that too, is just how much benefit we all get from uh, going, you know, to other people. Like I often talk about having the health team for yes. patients, but also for ourselves and having those mentors and knowing that we don't have to do it all on our own, especially when we're zero for eight. So <laughs> thank you for sharing that story with humility and uh, the fact that you um, embraced it and, you know, wrote an article about it, much less sharing it here too. That, that says a lot about a person. So. Oh, thanks for saying that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation and um, I appreciate you bringing Chinese medicine to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast show. A real pleasure for me. Thanks so much, Rosalie. Absolutely. And congrats once again on your book. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Don't forget to head over to the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com to download your beautifully illustrated recipe card and get a transcript of the show. There, you'll also be able to sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is the best way to stay in touch with me. You can also visit Toby directly at flourishmedicine.com. If you'd like more herbal episodes to come your way, then one of the best ways to support this podcast is by subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks, and I'm so glad that you're here as part of this herbal community. Also, a big round of thanks to the people all over the world who make this podcast happen week to week. Nicole Paul is the project manager who oversees the whole operation from guest outreach to writing show notes to actually uploading each episode and so many other things I don't even know. She really holds this whole thing together. Francesca is our fabulous video and audio editor. She not only makes listening more pleasant, she also adds beauty to the YouTube videos with plant images and video overlays. Tatiana Rusikova is the botanical illustrator who creates gorgeous plant and recipe illustrations for us. I love them. I know that you do too. Christy edits the recipe cards and then Jenny creates them as well as the thumbnail images for YouTube. 
Michelle is the tech wizard behind the scenes, and Karen is our student services coordinator and customer support. For those of you who like to read along, Jennifer is who creates the transcripts each week. Xavier, my handsome French husband, is the cameraman and website IT guy. One of the best ways to retain and fully understand something you've just learned is to share it in your own words. With that in mind, I invite you to share your takeaways with me and the entire Herbs with Rosalie community. You can leave comments on my YouTube channel, on the Herbs with Rosalie podcast.com show notes, or simply hit reply to my Wednesday email. I read every comment that comes in and I'm excited to hear your herbal thoughts, whether it's about Don Shen, Chinese medicine, or Tori Amos concerts. Okay, you've lasted to the very end of the show, which means you get your gold star and this herbal tidbit. Well, Don Shen is one of my favorite herbs to grow in the garden and perhaps one of the herbs that I've been growing the longest. This is a sage plant and it has these brilliant large purple sage flowers that attract all sorts of pollinators, including bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. The flowers last a really long time too, so they're just absolutely gorgeous in the garden. Then those beautiful red roots, well, those are loved by gophers. So I have to keep replacing the plants every couple of years, but I'm assured that the gophers around me have excellent heart health because of it. <laughs> but even still, I couldn't imagine my garden without Don Shen, so I keep growing them over and over. <laughs> 